Let's come back to the explicit specification. That's the set of documents that everyone on the development team would label specification. Why was that specification written? Sometimes companies structure development contracts around specifications. If the product doesn't conform to the spec, the customer can sue the company for breach of contract. Now, if that's your situation, you need a process for updating the spec and getting customer approval for those updates every time the program's design changes. But a whole lot of development isn't done by contract, or it's done by contracts that don't include authoritative specifications. So why would a company create a spec if it's not including it in a contract? Now, there are a lot of reasons, but they're very different reasons with different testing implications. So let's look at the other extreme. Some companies create specifications that work as vision documents. A vision document is a description of what people are thinking about building. Very early in the product, let's build something like this. The vision document might be very detailed, might even include working prototypes, but it's not kept up to date. It might help the tester who reads it to understand the original goals of the project. That's useful, but no one expects a point-by-point -point match between a vision document and the final program. Many companies create authoritative documentation subsets. When I say authoritative, what I mean is that the document's intended to be accurate, and if the program and the document don't match, the program's wrong. In my experience, it's common to write authoritative protocols. A protocol is a specification that describes the messages that one process can send to another. For example, Amazon.com sends messages to Visa all the time, creating charges and asking for refunds on somebody's account. There's a protocol to specify the structure and contents of those messages, and to specify how the receiver of the message responds back. So Visa says, sure, or it says, no, he can't spend that much money or it says that's not a valid visa number. Well, the protocol has to be authoritative so that programmers at Amazon and programmers at Visa can write code that they know will communicate effectively. So that's an example of an authoritative specification for part of a program. My experience is that it's common to write authoritative specs for a few things, but not for a whole program. Now let me suggest a different kind of authoritative specification. I once worked for a company that developed very secure consumer applications. The docs for developers were very aggressive. The requirement was to make it impossible for anybody to access your data. At any time that any tester reported a bug that conflicted with that goal, that bug got high priority and it got fixed right away. For developers, the goal of perfect security was authoritative. But unfortunately, the marketing people heard that and they started talking about it to the world. Perfect security is impossible. So it's not a good idea to make that as a promise to the world. So eventually I had to write a second specification for the marketing people. We decided that it was better to promise less than the system could actually do than to get sued for promising something we intended but couldn't quite achieve. So there were two truths. There was the truth for the programmers. This program has to be secure. Between the programmers and the testing folks, that truth was authoritative. Then there was the truth for the marketers. It promised less but that was authoritative between our company and the outside world. The marketing spec versus the development spec are examples of specifications written by and for different stakeholders. In American corporate jargon, you're the champion of something if you're the primary advocate for its success. Most often we talk about product champions. Typically the product champion is the project manager, the marketing manager, or the chief programmer. Whoever it is, the champion is the person who's recognized as having the responsibility and the motivation to make the product succeed. Products without champions often fail. So who's the champion for the specification? When you find a mismatch between the program and the spec, the program might be wrong or the spec might be wrong. If the spec's wrong, somebody has to fix it. The champion of the spec is the person who will try hardest to find time and resources to upgrade the spec as needed. A spec with no champion gets out of date. Testing the program against it gradually becomes an exercise in frustration. Next question, why are you working with the spec? Is it really to hunt for mismatches between the program and the spec? Yes, sometimes, but sometimes not. But suppose you get the spec before the code. So you can look for conceptual problems, you can look for design bugs, but as far as code to spec mismatches, that's impossible because there's no code. And sometimes you're not going to use the spec as a guide for testing. You use the spec as an oracle. Some other kind of test reports a, a problem. You check the spec to figure out if that problem is a bug. 
So there are lots of reasons and lots of ways to work with the spec. You should be conscious of yours. Next, what are the consequences of finding a mismatch between the program and the spec? If the company is developing software for its own use, the consequence depends on the nature of the mismatch. If an important feature doesn't work, that's bad. Some other deviations, not so bad. On the other hand, specifications that create legal obligations have to be followed. If you've got a customer who knows that they've been promised what's in the spec and then you give them something else, that's a problem. I said at the start of this lecture that the hardest part of specification-based testing is often figuring out what the spec is and what it says. So let's take a closer look at that. Normal reading habits don't work when you have complex specifications that evolve over a long time. These are collections of documents that run thousands of pages. And no matter which of the documents you start with, it's hard to figure out what it's saying. You go to page one, you start reading, and you realize every sentence has words that are undefined. The document's loaded with references to definitions and details in other documents. So you go to the other document and points to another document. Pretty soon you have eight documents open, you're flipping through them, trying to figure out what's there and what's there are references to more documents. Well, you can't keep all this in your head. Many people try to deal with these documents with passive reading. Passive reading, you go to the first page, you read it, you get to the end, you go to the second page, you just follow along, but you can't understand these documents this way. Many people try this way and they find they fall asleep. Well, that's not because the spec is boring. It's because the information overload is so intense that they shut down. When you find yourself falling asleep reading when you're not supposed to be tired or forgetting what you just read, don't blame yourself or call yourself stupid. Instead, recognize that you've got an information overload problem that you've got to manage. You have to read these documents differently. You have to use active reading strategies. You have to find the relevant information by looking in many different places and organizing it yourself. You also have to be aware that different people can have different understandings and opinions about the same feature. And if they do, the documents they'll write will present that feature differently. You'll have to develop a strategy for identifying and reconciling those differences. Rather than reading by starting with what's ever on page one, start by surveying the documents. Find out what the main topics are. Study the document's table of contents. Skim a few sections to see what they're talking about. Get an overview of the documents before you try to read anything in depth. And then prioritize. Decide what topic you want to learn about first. And whether it's on page one or page 1,000, start your work there. While you're reading, ask questions. Write your questions down. Make notes about how much of an answer you've found so far. Leave space so that you can add more details as you discover them in later reading. You can also organize what you're reading into categories instead of answers to questions. That lets you create your own informational structure and then sort everything you're learning into that structure. That's how you're going to work in this assignment. Adler and Van Doren is the classic book on active reading. Along with teaching you about surveying and skimming, they provide a lot of guidance on making notes as you go. An important part of the process of understanding what you're reading is explaining it to yourself or ideally to someone else. I just went through that this week with a friend who's learning FileMaker Pro. That's a program that lets you make databases. She's never created her own database before, so she was getting lost and bored following the book's examples. She'd follow all the steps, read all the words, but it wasn't working. So we sat down and talked about the examples. I didn't explain a thing. I just asked general questions. What was the example? What were you trying to do? Why do you think this FileMaker feature was relevant to this example? To tell me about the example, she had to think about them. She had to organize her thinking and put the pieces together in a way that made sense. It didn't take very long, but she was amazed at how much more she knew about what she'd been reading after explaining it than she knew before she explained it. This is why we give you the exam study guide. You'll learn the material better by explaining it, which is what you're doing when you craft answers to all the questions. It helps you clarify your thoughts and it helps you remember what you learned.